My name is Phil Sparks and I'm an ex-KPMG Chartered Accountant and Instructor at Financial Edge. Today, I'll be reviewing a recently released Sky Atlantic series called The Fear Index. The Fear Index is a four-part psychological and financial thriller set in Geneva. It's based on a 2011 best-selling book by Robert Harris. The main character is Dr. Alex Hoffman, played by Josh Hartnett, who, along with his partner Hugo Quarry, played by Arsha Ali, owns and runs a hedge fund bearing his own name, Hoffman Investment Technologies. Hoffman is obsessed with the human impulse towards fear, an aspect of psychology which he believes drives financial markets. The series opens with him in the back of a chauffeur-driven Maybach, traveling to his 42 million euro mansion on the shores of Lake Geneva. Although his life might seem to be a bit of a fairy tale, actually in 2020 the world's top 10 hedge fund managers were estimated to take home an average of $1.3 billion each. So this isn't by any stretch of the imagination a fictional scenario. So let's dive in. What exactly does Hoffman and his firm do? And what are these hedge funds? Well, a hedge fund can be defined as an actively managed investment pool whose managers use a wide range of strategies in an effort to beat average investment returns for their clients. They're considered risky alternative investment choices. Basically, hedge funds take money from investors and invest it in stocks and shares and other financial products, aiming to make more money for you than you could do alone, and as a result, greater fees for themselves. Later in the series, we find out that Hoffman's firm, Hoffman Investment Technologies, has a fund value of some $10 billion, which would make it around the 20th largest hedge fund in the world, alongside firms like BlackRock and Bridgewater. The main focus of the film is Hoffman's new AI or artificial intelligence computer system known as Vixal 4, which helps them analyze financial news, indices, and other key drivers to help them outsmart the markets and make profitable investments. So Vixal knew about the election? I speculated. Speculation could be worth 10 million. So we go short on Mr. Airways? That's what it's telling us. Right. I'll authorize it now. Bonsoir. In this clip, Vixel is helping them analyze political information as well as financial data and advising on investments. So let's have a look at what these hedge funds actually do by looking in a bit more detail at the Vista Airways transaction. Okay, I assume you all know what's going on here. Here is where the algorithm selects the trades. Here are our executed orders. Here's an option we put on last night for 12.5 million options to sell Vista Airways at 7.28 euros a share. That's a heck of a chunk of the market. It's a little risky if you don't mind me saying so. All airline stocks are fragile these days, Bill. I'm perfectly easy with that position. Vista Airways had 12% passenger growth in the final quarter and a revised profits forecast up 9%, plus they just took delivery of a new fleet of aircraft, so... I don't get that position. It makes no sense. May I? Of course. In this clip, we can see the Hoffman trading floor and the scene where he explains how Vixel's algorithm selects the trades and advises which investments to make, like the executed order for 12.5 million options to sell Vista Airways at €7.28 Euros per share. To understand this, we need to go back and look at some basic theory. So apologies for a bit of a school lesson. In this clip, Hoffman is talking about shares in a Vista Airways, and there's a share price of €7.28 mentioned. However, the price of a share doesn't just represent a company's current value, but also the market's expectation of future performance. So to beat the market, you need to have knowledge or a hunch of something that the rest of the investors don't know, which will cause the share price to go up or down, outside of what other investors are expecting. Hoffman mentions an option to sell. 
and previously you mentioned shorting Vista Airways. Again, what does all this mean? Now, you might have heard about something called derivatives. These are financial instruments that derive, hence derivatives, their price from something real in the market. For instance, if a share is currently trading at $10 in the market and I think it's likely to rise, I may be able to buy an option to buy that share in three months' time at the price of $10. But I need to pay $1 now for holding that option. If the price does indeed rise to $15, then I can exercise that option, which will allow me to buy the share for $10, sell it on the market at $15 and make a $5 profit. I do have to take into account the $1 cost of the option, but still my net profit is $4. There's a couple of interesting points. A call option here is used if we think the price is going to rise. These are the options to buy something at a given price. It's also referred to as going long on a stock or having a long position. This means that you own or will own that stock. The opposite is a put option, which is used if you think the price is going to fall. In this case, you pay a premium for the option to sell the stock. Agreeing to sell something you don't have is often known as going short on a stock or a short position. Basically, you are short of a share that you will sell in the future. This is what Hoffman was referring to when he said he was going short on Vista. Now, let's go back to the film and see why Hoffman Investment Technologies is doing so well. A computer can perform trillions of calculations every second. There's a physical limit to how much we can, as a species, process and absorb. There's no such limit for computers, as long as we give them enough processing power and memory. And on top of that, algorithms don't have imagination. They don't give in to panic, unlike humans. So that makes them ideally suited to trading in the financial markets. With our new generation of Vixel, we were able to isolate, measure, and factor in to our market calculations the element of price that derives entirely from human behavior. We built an algorithm that can adapt its strategy, and that's what gives it a competitive edge. So basically, this is just behavioral finance. You're gonna analyze every aspect of human behavior in the markets. Well, that would be impossible, as you all know. No. The solution was to choose one emotion for which we have substantive data. Which is? Fear. Fear is historically the strongest emotion in economics. I mean, remember FDR during the Great Depression? The most famous financial quote of all time. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. In fact, fear is probably the strongest human emotion, period. No one wakes up at four in the morning because they're happy, do they? And children leave the light on because they fear the dark. We put our money into safes because we fear it being stolen. We act on fear. With Fixel, we are able to correlate recent market fluctuations with the frequency of fear-related words in the media. And the conclusion we've drawn is that fear is driving the world like never before. The success we've had at this firm speaks for itself. The market has endured two years of panic, which has made our algorithm thrive because humans act in very predictable ways when they're frightened. And we've only gone and found a way to make money out of it. Over the past decade or so, the increasing capability of computers has helped finance professionals analyze the factors that drive share prices. Computers can now perform millions of calculations per second and work fast enough to, for instance, look for correlations between, say, raw material prices and the performance of particular companies. And then the moment oil prices start to move, the computer advises which companies to buy or sell. In addition, we can go one step further and computers can actually trade by themselves, making use of tiny and short opportunities in the market, known as high frequency trading. However, these automatic trades bring a few of their own risks. In particular, increased volatility in market prices. With so much algorithmic high-frequency trading designed to outsmart competitors, algorithms tend to react in the same direction, to, for instance, falling or rising prices. 
e.g. if prices are falling, to stop losses becoming too extreme, most systems will be programmed to sell. If everyone sells, there are more sellers than buyers, and the price falls, hence a downward spiral. Hence higher volatility, or bigger and more rapid swings in prices. Regulators have attempted to put in place rules to limit the risk, such as the recent SEC requirement that requires developers and supervisors to abide by all SEC and FINRA regulations. However, as we'll see in the next clip, Hoffman has lost control of Vixel. I need to know if you're taken off the position limit. What? No, of course not. But it's been removed. That's impossible. Vixel's just breached the limit and trades are soaring. I thought you must have authorized it. This is wrong. It's just wrong. I, I mean, the trade's good, they're going on. That's not the bloody point. The limit is there for a reason. We have to close Vixel down now. This clip refers to position limits being removed. So the Vixel system is now trading without constraints. And not just multiple small trades, it's buying huge stakes in companies. Now, you might be glad that the drama in the series isn't only provided by the complexities of derivative trading or the regulation of automatic trading systems. This is where the series starts to bear some resemblance to the 1983 film War Games, where a computer had been given the nuclear launch codes and almost started World War III. Vixel 4 has been programmed to identify the factors that lead to changes in market sentiment and take advantage of the opportunities this will open up. So as most of you will be aware, the Chicago Board of Exchange operates what's known as the S&P 500 Volatility Index, or VIX. It's essentially a ticker tracking the price of options on stocks traded on the S&P 500, and it shows the implied volatility of the market in the coming month. The higher the index, the greater the uncertainty, which is why traders call it the fear index. So the VIX was our starting point, which gives us a massive data going back to 1993, which we then pair with new behavioral indices, which we've compiled, and bring that all together with existing methodology. And we started with VIXOL 1. Now we're up to our fourth iteration, VIXOL 4. Is this thing operational? VIXOL 4 took control of the entire fund a week ago. And? Well, as of last night, it was up about 79.7 million. Now let's just pause to unpack that segment. There's a lot of terminology here. A US exchange, the Chicago Board of Exchange, calculates something called the VIX index, which is a measure of expected volatility, i.e. do we expect prices to shoot up rapidly or down in the next month or continue on a smooth and steady trajectory. When the index is high, which is around 30 or more, that implies big changes are coming, i.e. there's a lot of nervousness or fear in the market, hence its colloquial name, the fear index. The calculation of this index is complex. For any math boffins out there, it's a bit like running the Black Skulls model, but in reverse. In simple terms, it looks forward to give the standard deviation or width of expected price movements over the next month. It's based on options on the S&P 500, which is the average stock market value for the biggest US companies, and by working backwards from quoted option prices, the implied volatility can be calculated. This gives the VIX figure. Very simply, the bigger the VIX figure, the greater the level of movement that is expected in the S&P over that next month. This is why VIXL is called VIXL. It's based on the VIX index. The VIX index was the starting point in developing VIXL, but the system is now collecting data, financial, economic, and general world news to forecast this volatility and in turn the impact on future share prices. So let's see if it's working for Hoffman. Trades have stopped on Tropics Pharmaceuticals. Closing prices up over 900%. Okay, so what? Trading stopped because we own it. Tropics is now owned by 14 different companies. Those companies hold the majority on Tropics shares. They own the whole thing. As of 27 minutes ago, Hoffman Investment Technologies owns every one of those 14 companies. We've purchased them all. So we own and control Tropics. 
I didn't authorize that. With the authorized Eleanor, I'll fix those few right now. The key drama in this series, therefore, comes from the fact that Vixel is starting to operate independently. It builds up an enormous stake in one company. It's acting independently. What did you say? We're no longer in control. It's making choices. It's learning and adapting. Maximizing profits, but in a way that's far more creative than I ever thought possible. Maximizing profits? For who? Janu? No, forget Janu. This is bigger than that. It's sentient. Fix all. It's sentient. In the final two episodes of the series, we move away from the trading floor and perhaps into the realms of science fiction. Hoffman is convinced that he's being manipulated by Hugo, his colleague, Bob, his previous boss, or by someone or even something else. The viewer wonders whether it's a conspiracy against Hoffman or Hoffman himself, himself is having some sort of breakdown. I won't spoil the climax in the last episode, but that's where we find out who the culprit is. I know today has been uh, a little erratic. I've been a little erratic and I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but something really big is happening and we need to take Vixal offline. Do you understand? Okay, so. I want you guys all to start dismantling our positions that we've built up since this morning. I don't, I don't know how long it's going to take, so we need to get the Delta back in line, hedge it out with longs in other markets, and even liquidate if you have to. Do you understand? The series is a good, if slightly gruesome and far-fetched yarn. It could represent a warning against our increasing reliance on information systems. It's clearly well-researched, the financial qualities are spot on, and it's definitely worth a watch. I hope this review gives you a little understanding of some of the financial trading aspects that underpin the series, and therefore a greater insight into what's going on in the show. He's making us money. Isn't that what we do here? Money, forget money for once, Hugo, forget money! This isn't about money, it's beyond that! I designed it to learn, and it's big, and it's powerful, and it has no conscience. Do you understand how fucking dangerous that is? If you enjoyed this review, don't forget to like and subscribe, click the button down here, and, and then you'll get to see more stuff like this.